Well, hello, John Dawson again. If you're on the channel, you know who I am and what we're doing. We're looking at the Ten Commandments, and for this week, we're going to look at the Second Commandment. The Second Commandment is don't make any idols. It's talking about worship, not only who we worship, because the First Commandment was have no other gods before me. God is God. He is our God, and so we worship him because we're his. We belong to him, and he has done so much for us. Here, God tells us not only that we are to worship him and him alone, but we're told how to worship him. I'm going to read this from our catechism, which is the old King James. You shall not make unto thee any graven image, that's the idol, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or the earth beneath, or the water under the earth, that is, of any thing, whether it's a celestial thing, whether it's on the earth, whether it's down in the sea, or anything like that, and thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. And the word serve here means worship. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy to thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. In the end, there's this warning that even the iniquity of the fathers can continue down a generation or two. We do see this in uh, generational sins where one father will sin and that sin will have its root in the child and the child will maintain that sin. It takes sometimes extra grace of God to have that rooted out so it doesn't remain. But note here, third and fourth generations can be at peril, but for those that love the Lord, that mercy comes to thousands. It's even greater. The reason annexed to the second commandment is God's sovereignty over us. He's our king. He is our God. And his propriety in us, that means we belong to him and him alone. And the zeal he has for his own worship. We are created to worship God. We're created to worship, period. And if we're not going to worship the God who created us, we'll find ourselves another thing to worship, to serve. And that's what these idols are about. The negative part of this commandment is that we're not to worship God in a way that he's told us not to. We should worship him the way he wants to be worshipped. But doesn't that make sense anyway? If you're going to have a party for someone, going to cook their favorite foods, you're not going to cook the things they're allergic to or the things they hate, right? It's there to celebrate. And so in the same way, God directs us how we are to worship. And we worship the Lord the way that God has directed us to worship. That seems to make sense. And yet people often want to think of worship as something different, something that they invent for themselves. Well, I really like this. Well, yeah, but if you're going to have a party for me, have something that I like, if it's really for me. If it's just an excuse for you to do something, don't call it a party for me. And that's really what God is saying here. If you're going to worship, and we should, and we must, frankly, we will, we should worship God the way that he has directed. Now, in the negative aspect, the big thing is we should not have idols. We should not have images. Images in our worship that focus our mind on that thing rather than on God is what God is forbidding here. In the book of Isaiah, the prophet has a really, I think it's very funny the way he says this. This is in Isaiah 44. He talks about the foolishness of images. Those, this is Isaiah 44, verse 9. Those who make an image, and this is an image for worship, an idol, all of them are useless. Their precious things shall not profit. They are their own witnesses. They neither see nor know that they may be ashamed. Who would form a god or mold an image that profits him nothing? Surely all his companions would be ashamed. The workmen are mere men. Let them be gathered together. Let them stand up. Let them fear. Let them be ashamed together. The blacksmith with the tongs works one hand in the coals and fashions it with the hammers and works with the strength of his arm. Even so, he is hungry. His strength fails. He drinks no water. He is faint. 
The craftsman stretches out his rule. He marks one out with chalk. He fashions it with a plane, marks it with a compass, makes it like the figure of a man, according to the beauty of a man, that it may remain in his house. So here we have what's causing these images, these idols, craftsmen. It's beautiful, but it's just the work of a human, fallible, mortal being. And what is being created is less than the one who creates it because the idols have ears but can't hear. They have eyes, but they can't see. And the goes on here to say, well, what about those who, who don't have uh, enough money to hire a craftsman to work in a good metal? Maybe something lovely like silver or gold or something that would last like bronze. He'll take and use a, a piece of wood. Verse 14, he cuts down cedars for himself takes the cypress and the oak, secures it for himself among the trees of the forest. He plants a pine, the rain nourishes it. And when it'll be for a man to burn, he'll take some of it to warm himself. Yes, he kindles it and bakes bread. And he makes a god and he worships it. He makes a carved image and falls down to it. He burns half of it in the fire. And with this half, he eats meat. He roasts a roast and is satisfied and even warms himself and says, I am warm, I've seen the fire. And the rest of the image he makes into a god, his carved image, he falls down before it and he worships it. He prays to it and says, deliver me for you're my god. Why I say this is so hilarious, it's a piece of wood, maybe one that won't rot. And he'll take and he'll carve out the image that is his idol that he's now going to worship and serve. And what's he going to do with the wood shavings? Well, it makes good kindling, so he'll build his fire. And the rest of the wood, he'll burn and he'll roast. And the obvious question is, how do you know that you burnt the right part? What if the part you carved away was the God part, and you're left with your firewood, and you're worshiping your firewood? But what the prophet is saying is, of course, you're worshiping your firewood. That's all that is. It's firewood that's been made pretty. It's been made lovely. Those who worship idols are like this. He feeds on ashes. A deceived heart has turned him aside, and he cannot deliver his soul, nor can he say, Is there not a lie in my right hand? Is there not a lie here? This is not something real and satisfying. Now we, because we're more enlightened and more modern, we don't have little images that we would take and bow down to or burn incense in front of and say that you're my God. But we do worship things. We think that those things will help us. I was talking to some missionaries. Uh, they were missionaries in Brazil, and the folks there said, are you going to consult your God? And I said, what do you mean? He says, that thing in your hand you're always looking at. Where should I go? What should I do? What do I need to know? It tells me everything. It's your cell phone, right? Do we treat that as if it is our God that will direct us? And do we spend time slavishly looking at it? Am I getting too close to home? There are also some churches that will have relics, things that are somehow associated with a saint, and they think, well, there's the presence of God there. And yet, no, we're not to worship in those ways. By the way, all of our worship should be as God directs. It's not about us and our preference. It's about what God has said to do. We have the reading of the word and the preaching of the word. We have the singing of the psalms, and we sing psalms and hymns and spiritual psalms, making melody in our heart to the Lord. We bring our, our prayers. We bring our hearts to the Lord. We receive God's grace from prayer, from the preaching of the word from the sacraments. So we try to look at what we do, and while we want to do it in a good way, we shouldn't be adding extra things and be careful of that. Well, that's generally what we talk about when we talk about the second commandment. What are idols? And not just the things that you can make, but what about the idols of your heart that you think that thing will save me? 
And so I'm working really hard to get a certain amount of money. And once I have that, then I'll be set. We know from the scripture, Jesus' parable about the man who tore down his barns to build bigger ones. It didn't save him. He was dying that night. We've also learned that if you put things in the market, in the bank, wherever, they don't seem to last forever, do they? They can take wings. So we need to be careful that we're not just chasing after something, thinking that's what's going to give me the good life. That can be serving almost to the point of serving religiously. Someone said that we work at our play and play at our worship and worship our work. That shouldn't be. We should work our work and play our play, but we should worship our worship. We should worship the Lord. That should be at the core of our hearts. Now, the positive part of this commandment is it requires the receiving, observing, and keeping pure and entire all such religious worship and ordinances as God has appointed in his word. There is a positive ask aspect of worship. And while we're not to use the images, not to have items of worship just for our own desires, our own preferences, but to have our preferences be in line with God's commands and God's preferences. The positive thing is that we are worshiping God. It's not enough to say, well, I didn't make any idols. But have you worshipped the Lord? The Lord is your God. We need to worship the Lord always. I want to talk about two aspects of that. The first is private worship. There is corporate worship. That's where the church gathers and we worship together. And there the presence of Christ is seen in the church. But Jesus even said, you know, where two or three are gathered, I'm there in your midst. It doesn't have to be a large gathering to be corporate worship. But what about private worship? What about your heart? This is the aspect of the Christian life that no one else can see. Not really. Because when you're praying in your prayer closet, and it doesn't have to be a closet, when you're alone praying, there's no one there. You don't do it for someone else to see. You do it because you belong to the Lord. And as you pray, you receive God's grace. As you read God's word, you receive God's grace. As you meditate, the Lord leads you and directs you. Psalm 91 is a great psalm of solace. You know, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I want you to think about this. Don't skip over that first verse, and the rest of the psalm is wonderful, especially as it's talking about the pestilence that comes, the plagues, the armies that come, and the arrows that fly by day. We can turn on the news and see projectiles being thrown in our cities. We are turn on the news, and we're constantly being updated about how many people have this particular virus that everyone's so concerned about. And here's the, the reality. That is not the only virus out there. There's all sorts of things that plague us, that intimidate us. But that first verse, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High, lives there. There's the command to dwell in the secret place of the Most High. What does that mean, to dwell well, it's where you live. It's where you hang out. It's where you are comfortable. It's where your base is. And you go from the base out into the rest of the world. So the base is where? It's in the secret place of the Most High. It's under the shadow of the Almighty. That's where you're dwelling. That's where you're abiding. We shouldn't think of that as a physical place. Now, we are physical beings, and if you have a particular place where you go to pray, when you go there, you start to pray. If you have a place where you go and you play, when you go there, you start to play. My wife was set up by her father with a certain place. He says, this is a place to study. I want you to study here. That's all I want you to do here. It was not a real attractive place. 
It was just a small spot for study. And so whatever you do, that's what you'll do there rather than doing other things. I will say this is a problem I have. I spend a lot of time on the computer because I write on the computer and I research on the computer, but I can also play on the computer. I can waste time on the computer. Does this track with anyone else? Are we aware of the time? And if you're spending all of your time running through the news feed, where are you dwelling? In the news feed, aren't you? If you spend all of your time you know, playing a certain game, where are you abiding? In that game, your focus is there. How is it that you can abide under the shadow of the Almighty in the secret place of the Most High? It goes back to the prayer and the time of prayer and anchoring your heart in prayer. Taking time to worship, taking time to not only give the things to the Lord that are on your heart, because if you don't, they're just going to drive you crazy. You ever have problems that you're thinking about and you're thinking about and you get more and more anxious and you get more and more agitated? And what you need to do is stop and go to the Lord in prayer. And as it says in Psalm 131, you know, my heart uh, is not lifted up high or things beyond me, like a, like a child, a weaned child on his mother's lap. I, I'm stilled. To be still before the Lord. To be still. And then from there to remain in the Lord. Oh, those are wonderful days when you do that and you see other people. And rather than just see other people, you see other people from the place of safety, from the place of being abiding in the Lord. St. Patrick had a prayer. They called it the breastplate of St. Patrick. Um, you know, the eye of Christ between me and every eye, the mouth of Christ between me and every mouth, everything around me to have Christ between me and that person, that thing, what they say, what they do. And then the result is I cannot be harmed beyond Christ. And as attacks come, they come not just to me, but they come to me as I am in the secret place of the Most High. And they come against Christ as well. And the power of God gives my heart confidence and peace, even in difficult times. I think it was Ray Steadman in his book, with the Calvary Road said, you don't lose your peace over someone else's sin. And you could argue with that and say that there's certain sins as you see them that really upset you. But losing your peace, by that he means you have left the secret place of the Almighty. You've left that dwelling place of the Most High. That losing your peace is from your sin. And what's the sin? Leaving the place of the Lord. Going out. Fighting without him. Seeing things without him. Doing things without him. It's there we get tempted. It's there we fall into sin. It's there that we take wounds that we need not take or would not hurt us in the same way if we were dwelling with the Lord. Time, dedicated time to spending with the Lord is important. This is personal worship. We are to receive and observe and keep pure and entire all such religious worship and ordinances as the Lord has appointed in his word. Didn't Jesus say when you pray, go into your closet, shut the door. We don't pray for show but we can pray for power and have power when we're in the secret place. I believe that is where worship begins. You can walk into a church building and come to a church service and have all sorts of reactions to it, but if your heart is not first tuned to the Lord Jesus Christ, you're not going to be tuned to the Lord Jesus Christ there either. Most of the time, when I go and I, I hear a sermon preached, I go to listen for the voice of the Lord. 
I know one preacher said, well, I, I, I rewrite the sermon in my own head how I would have written it. And I just don't because that's too much work. <laughs> Here, God is speaking through the word that's being preached if I'm able to hear it. Occasionally, the minister will get in the way and be saying things that just don't make sense with the word. And that's when I start to really preaching for the prayer, prayer for the preacher and also for this guy that I might be able to still to be rooted in the Almighty, dwelling in the secret place of the Most High. But I would really suggest that you go and you go with your spirit open to hear what the Spirit is saying through the reading and especially through the preaching of the Word. Even if it's said differently. In fact, that it's said differently is a good thing. Well, now I need to talk a little bit about corporate worship. And a lot of what the Catechism is referring to is corporate worship. That's the worship where we come together. We come together and we encourage one another. We come together and we worship the Lord together. This is not something you can do by yourself. It's important to realize how necessary corporate worship is. Now, I like to sing, and my voice is not too bad yet. I think it used to be better, but I can sing. But I'm not, I can't, certain, certain things I can't do by myself. I can't sing harmony. I can't sing four-part harmony. Okay, I was in a big, big, big parking garage in Philadelphia, and I'd sing out a note, and then sing another pitch, and then sing another pitch, and then listen and have all three come back. That's a trick. Yes, my voice is still reverberating around, but I can't sing in harmony with myself. But to sing in harmony with other people, it's like a dance, and it's a joy. And not only that, but when you're praising God together, you join together. It multiplies, it amplifies the joy I feel when others are there. I'll also say that when I'm preaching, and I'm preaching and I see as people are hearing, I can watch and see on their faces the Lord moving in their hearts. I can see the, the nods. Sometimes I'll see other expressions, but that's something that really ministers to me too. I really want people to know. I bring people up into the pulpit so they can look out and see. They think, well, I'm just part of a group out here. You're not a part of a group. You're one face and another face. You're a group of faces and everyone's clearly visible. Realize that. You're there. You're engaged. You're taking part by your presence. And I'm really encouraged to see that. The scripture says this in Hebrews verse uh, 10, chapter 10, verse 24. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. The word there for one another is the one that's used in the scriptures quite a bit. And we need to think about that because the one another is important. The one anothering. We're with one another. We encourage one another. We teach one another. We rebuke one another. We pray for one another. We help one another. We love one another. This is one of the ways we do it in worship. Verse 25 goes on, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. This is the day of the Lord's return, the day of the Lord's judgment. We need to be faithful. The book of Hebrews is about Jesus Christ, how Christ is better than the older revelation. Christ is better than the old priests, than the angels, than the old sacrifices, than all the things that we see. It all points forward to Christ. And that's the theological bend of the book there in just a, a sentence or two. So if you want to know about Jesus and how Jesus is better than, read the book of Hebrews. And since it deals a lot with the Old Testament, if you want to understand the Old Testament better, read the book of Hebrews. But there's another theme in the book of Hebrews. It's a very cash value, a very practical theme, and that is don't allow others to drift away. We're responsible for one another. In fact, in the early chapters, it uses that image of a boat 
anchor. You know, hope is an anchor. In fact, that's a symbol that we use for a hope is the anchor. You're anchored to something solid. The hope is not just the idea that maybe there's something there. No, the hope is the thing you're anchored to. And don't let others drift away. Here in this verse, we see it again. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another. So more as you see the day approaching. How are we going to love, stir up one another to love and good works if we're not with one another? We need to communicate with one another. This is why it's a blessing to be in worship. And now we have something to think about. For a few weeks, we were told that it's best not to gather. And so we did what we could do. We encouraged people to read the word. And we live streamed a service where you could be with me and those making music to sing, to pray, to read the word, to hear the word, and in our hearts to respond to the word. And yet that's not really gathering for worship, is it? Even still, there are folks who ought not to be out because of their own immune uh, compromised situation, their own health, and we do not want to be the cause of anyone uh, getting sick or dying. I think people need to be prudent in those ways. This is a special concern to me because of my grandson, whose lungs are such that his parents are extraordinarily guarded and have always been, since he's always been this way, to keep him healthy. And now with the pandemic, they're, it's just the same. They're vigilant, but they've always been vigilant. And I am all for doing what we can to keep him healthy. Such a wonderful boy, such a wonderful young man. And you know people like this as well. So I'm soft-hearted and want to be helpful to those who need to be protected. I think we should always be doing that. However, we need to be creative in for those things, but we need to be meeting together. It is difficult when we're not together. And there's some places where the authorities have said, well, you can't gather in a church building to worship. And there was even a, a, a large gathering in a church building for a funeral of someone where folks were saying, you know, this is how you should do. And there is some hypocrisy in people gathering together, saying you can't gather together. Uh, I don't quite understand that. But I will say this about our leaders, our civil leaders. Uh, it's a tough, difficult job for which they are responsible, and we need to be praying for them, always. They have different responses, and they're in different places. I don't agree. You don't agree. Maybe they're too strict. Maybe they're not strict enough. Pray for them, because they are responsible before God. But I will say this, too. We gather together, and we have gotten perhaps a little soft and comfortable, because we have buildings that we gather in. These buildings are even air-conditioned. The air conditioning goes out and we go, oh dear, now what are we going to do? I was preaching in a small church in Tennessee. I was the supply there for about five months. And somebody came through with a truck and took out the power line. We got to church that Sunday and there was no air conditioning. And it was August. And it was in southern Tennessee, not far from Alabama. It was hot. They tried to open the windows. The windows had been painted shut. Uh, yes, we did what we could, but we were very aware and glad we were when power was restored and we could be more comfortable. Churches have not always been air-conditioned. We get used to that. Churches have not always been visible. We get used to that, too. The early church didn't meet in nice buildings. They met in catacombs. They met in secluded places. They would meet in houses, and when they were being persecuted, they had to do so hiding. In China right now, there are churches that meet in hiding because the Chinese government have not approved them. We pray for those believers. We want to have those believers. 
Think about this. We do what we can, and we should do what we can. But it's not the comfortable things that we're entitled to. How do we meet together? The best we can. How do we encourage one another? The best we can. We do have means, through electronic means, even this one, where we can communicate. There's the telephone. And there's the old-fashioned pulling up and visiting with people. We need to worship together. One of the reasons that is in this uh, commandment as well, and one of the ordinances we have, is to meet on the Lord's Day, to worship. It's not an optional thing. It's what God told us to do. And people will say, you know, when I do that, my week winds up better. I say, well, how about that? When you sleep a good night's sleep, your next day is better too, isn't it? When we do the things God would have us do, we'll be better. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we do ask that you would open our eyes to see the ways that we are to, uh, are, are to worship you. That you would pull from us the idols that we would put up. Lord, we ask too that you would help us to guard our time and our heart that we would love you. Spending that time with you that we might dwell in that seat.